Why did it take 10 days for officials in Thailand to report information that could help in the search for the missing Malaysian Airlines jet? A news helicopter crashes in flames near Seattle Space Needle, killing two people on board. We'll follow the path to sainthood of former Opus Dei leader Alvaro Del Portillo. And tonight, we'll meet a young lady who serves as a living witness to the value of every human life. Those stories and much more just ahead on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, March 18th, 2014. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Brian Patrick in for Colleen Carroll Campbell. We begin tonight looking at news now. Two people are dead this evening after a helicopter crash in Seattle. It happened near the Space Needle as the news chopper was taking off from a nearby TV station. Station officials think the helicopter hit the side of the building before crashing into the street. The two people on board were killed. Another man managed to break free from a car that was hit. He was taken to the hospital and is in critical condition. The controversy continues in Crimea. Russian President Vladimir Putin signed a treaty today, adding the peninsula, which had been part of Ukraine, to the Russian map. It comes after Crimeans overwhelmingly voted this weekend to break away from Ukraine and join Russia. U.S. and European leaders say the vote was invalid because it didn't include all of Ukraine. Vice President Joe Biden called it nothing more than a land grab. Unfortunately, Russia's leaders have responded with a brazen, brazen military incursion, with a purposeful ratcheting up of ethnic tensions inside Ukraine, with a rushed and illegal referendum in Crimea that was, not surprisingly, rejected by virtually the entire world. The British military is cutting ties with Russia. Foreign Secretary William Hague faults Russian President Vladimir Putin with choosing a path of isolation. Meanwhile, tonight we're learning about a delay in the search for the missing Malaysian jetliner because crucial information wasn't shared. Flight 370 mysteriously disappeared 10 days ago. Searchers initially focused on the wrong area because of a lack of radar data. But officials in Thailand announced today that they tracked a plane around the time Flight 370 disappeared. They say they now they didn't report it because no one specifically asked them as the search moves forward. Pope Francis, of course, is asking people to pray for the passengers and crew members. This disappearance has left a whole lot more questions than answers. Joining us to sort it all out, the AP Airlines writer Scott Merowitz, joining us from San Diego. Scott, what do you make of this report out of Thailand? This has been all over the news for the past 10 days. How do you not report something like this? Yeah, this jet's disappearance continues to amaze everyone, and this is just one more baffling piece of information here. If you look at the region, there are a lot of countries that aren't democracies. The military have control over things like radar, and it's not necessarily uh, in contact with the ruling party. Everybody knew about this instance, and to actually come out and say, well, no one asked us, is very shocking. But I think it's very um, specific to the countries in Southeast Asia where you do have this split between the military and civilian rulers. Scott, what are the likely theories now being explored about this disappearance? Uh, the list of theories just continues to grow, some plausible and some that are worthy of being in a science fiction movie. But the ones that, you know, we've taken seriously are, again, that this could be a terrorist action. This could, uh, unfortunately, be a mass murder or suicide by some of the pilots. There could have been a mechanical problem, you know, smoke fills the cockpit and the pilots, for whatever reason, become disabled and not able to land the plane. Or there could have still been some type of catastrophic failure of the plane that we don't know about, but it happened way off of uh, anywhere anybody is searching. Scott, as a reporter, how do we cover a story like this when there's very little fact, most of it's just speculation or theory? Yeah, and I think this has been one of the hardest challenges that we've had. We have a team of reporters in Asia and in the United States who've been working this story for the last week and a half. And 
there's constant speculation on TV. There are numerous leads that we're getting people calling us about. We're seeing things on the internet. And we really have to take a step back and still hold the same standards we have. And it's frustrating because you hear of all these theories. They might seem plausible. They might not. And you need to try to find experts who will actually tell you what's going on. We recently had a conference call where all the editors and reporters from around the globe basically said, let's take a step back for a minute. Let's look at all the information we have. Let's comb through what we've already reported. And then let's see what the larger perspective here is. And hopefully that's what responsible journalists are doing. They're trying to shed some new light into this mystery and also put a little perspective out there for people who are fascinated by this tale. All right, Scott, we appreciate you joining us, and hopefully we'll have some new facts soon. Let us join Pope Francis in praying for the families of those who are missing. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Californians are recovering tonight after a 4.4 magnitude earthquake. It happened yesterday morning. The quake was felt in Los Angeles, but no major damage has been reported. Will the Pope come to America? Well, he has another reason to come now. House Speaker John Boehner has invited our Holy Father to address Congress. No word on when that might happen, or even if it will. Boehner's invitation comes after Archbishop Charles Chaput of Philadelphia said he is confident Pope Francis will attend the World Meeting of Families in Philly next year. A special item will soon be on display at a Polish museum. It is the gun used in the assassination attempt on John Paul II. The museum's curator bought it, or brought it, rather, to Poland today. This is all ahead of an exhibit honoring John Paul II ahead of his canonization next month. Tensions are high along the Syria-Lebanon border. Gunmen are taking over the Lebanese town of Arsal. That's where a lot of refugees from the Syrian civil war have moved. But Hezbollah militants are making life difficult on the Lebanese side of the border as well. A group of nearly 200 Catholic employers has filed a lawsuit, a new lawsuit, to stop portions of the nation's new health care law from taking effect. The employers include archdiocese, an insurance company, and a nursing home. The recently formed Catholic Benefits Association asks others in the U.S. District Court to allow them to opt out of the mandated coverage. Well, a former abortion clinic worker will spend at least five years in prison. A judge gave Sherry West the sentence after she pleaded guilty to third-degree murder, among other charges. Prosecutors say West gave a patient too much medication during an abortion. West worked for infamous abortionist Kermit Gosnell. Jeannie Monahan, president of March for Life, and Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, join us now to discuss these stories. Jeannie, this is a former technician in the Gosnell Clinic, uh, the abortion facility. Do you think this was an isolated case, or is this more common? No, no. Abortion clinics are not regulated well. At the time that this all happened with Gosnell, abortion clinics were regulated at the level of beauty parlors or veterinary clinics or pools. So, um, and, and Pennsylvania, believe it or not, was one of the 27 states who actually had decent laws on the books with regard to abortion clinic regulations. So, no, I absolutely don't think this is an isolated incident at all. In fact, there's a pro-life group that sent around pro postcards to different abortion clinics this summer following all of this with a picture of Gosnell, some of his clinic workers, and said, call this, you know, hotline if, if your abortion doctor is doing some of these things and, and you don't want to get in trouble. And they got many, many calls. They've been doing all sorts of research on this. So, no, I don't think it's an isolated incident at all. And, and Molly, you were the one that really brought this attention to the mainstream media, this story. How did you, did you, how did you do that? Well, I've been frustrated for years that this story hadn't gotten coverage. I mean, it's pretty salacious. We've got a serial murderer. He kept, he kept trophies of his victims. There were all sorts of different angles that could have been pursued by all different types of reporters, whether you're interested in immigration or women's rights or abortion or any number of things. And nobody was covering it. And I was frustrated for years. And so finally, I just started asking reporters individually why they were participating in this blockout, this blackout of coverage of this salacious abortionist uh, story. But now this sentencing really isn't getting any coverage. It's kind of disappeared. That's what I find so funny about this, or uh, grimly funny, is that after the story broke, all these reporters and editors admitted that they hadn't been on top of the story and they should have done a better job. They issued all these mea culpas, and then here we are again, just a few short months later, and once again, they're not covering the story. It's, it's unfortunate. Jeannie, do you think that uh, there's any way to, to get more of these 
these violations that you say exist out there in these facilities out to the general public through the mainstream media? Well, we, we do our best to compile them, and then we also... Um there have been many more regulations that have been uh, accepted in state legislatures through the years. But I'm, I, one thing that I'm thinking about as Molly's talking is the whole role of social media in this. Mm -hmm. Since mainstream media isn't reporting, social media has a very important role to play. And with the Gosnell story, um, a tweet fest was very helpful in this whole thing. And I know with the March for Life that social media in many ways sort of smoked out the mainstream media to be able to cover our story a little bit more, to cover the numbers of the hundreds of thousands of people who attend. So I think that's one of the things that we can do. All right, another topic I'm going to ask Molly to, to uh, comment on. St. Patrick's Day is a time for celebration. Now it's turning into a time of controversy. New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio boycotted that city's St. Patrick's Day parade because groups advocating homosexuality weren't allowed to march carrying their signs. Big name sponsors like Guinness Beer decided not to participate. New York Archbishop Cardinal Timothy Dolan weighing in. He didn't advocate for gay activist groups in the parade, but he said that he encouraged individuals who are gay to participate. What do you make of all this, Molly? It's an interesting story. Again, people are free to march. They're just not free to march if they are making a political argument. So pro-life groups were not allowed to march in the same way that uh, Irish Queer, which is the group that was trying to get uh, to take part in this march. They also were not allowed to march. It's not a political march. It's a march for St. Patrick and Irish pride. So the organizers should be well within their rights to organize however they however they wish and keep it from being a political march, which would make it less fun for everybody. So people who were pro-life could march, but they couldn't carry signs. People who were promoting gay marriage or whatever it was could march, but they weren't, they weren't allowed to carry signs. And getting back, it, this is a celebration of a saint, isn't it? Right. It seems kind of interesting that here we have an actual religious parade and people are confused about whether it should be kept as a religious parade. Not everything needs to be uh, open to all uh, political persuasions or whatnot. And uh, it seems like it'd be a great time to just have fun marching as, when everybody gets to be Irish, whether they are Irish like me or not. <laughs> <laughs> and we, with a name like Patrick. All right. Molly Hemingway and Jeannie Monahan, thank you for joining us on EWTN News Nightly. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us. Prince William and his wife, Kate, joined in the St. Patrick's Day celebration in the UK. This is video of the royals at yesterday's St. Patrick's Day parade. The Irish guard was on hand for the ceremony, and one guardsman even gave the Duchess of Cambridge a shamrock. Coming up from the Vatican, we'll hear about a man who's on his way to sainthood, Bishop Alvaro del Portillo, former head of Opus Dei. And later on, we'll show you the coins and stamps the Vatican has issued to mark Pope Francis' first year. Thank you so much for joining us for EWTN News Nightly on this Tuesday, March the 18th. I'm Brian Patrick and we go to Rome. Our Alan Holdren has fresh news from the Vatican. Alan? So here in Rome, the flight to the, from the Ukraine is, is just, uh, just a brief one, relatively, just a couple of hours. And uh, this week has brought the uh, leader of the Greek Catholics of the Ukraine, the majority population of Catholics there, uh, to the Pope to bring him up to speed on exactly what's going on there. Now, uh, we know from that closed-door meeting that the Pope uh, gave his assurance uh, of his blessings and, uh, and his hope for peace there in the Ukraine. We also know, speaking from a Greek Catholic priest here in Rome, that there are only five priests on the island of Crimea. Now, of these five, one has been kidnapped, released, and has since fled the island. Uh, of the other four, all have gone into hiding, so it's a real difficult situation there. Uh, we know that Vatican diplomacy is working on, uh, on their part to, to come to some sort of a solution. Um, also here in Rome, the Pope has uh, come back from his, his spiritual exercise, he came back last Friday. Uh, he's been doing a series of pastoral activities. Uh, just this last Sunday, he was at a local Roman parish going out to the peripheries to meet people in person. Tomorrow, he'll be at the general audience. Uh, he'll be speaking to people as he always does, giving a, a little catechesis. And then on Friday, he's going to be going to another Roman parish in an unprecedented activity. He's meeting with the victims of mafia activity in Italy. Uh, so that'll be something to look out for as, uh, as time goes on this week. And uh, otherwise in Rome, it's really a springtime of activity uh, leading up to the canonizations of John Paul II and John the XXIII. Uh, it's really a celebration of sanctity. And uh, it's, it's not only them who are being, being celebrated, but also other holy people, like uh, the leader of the group that, that seeks sanctity in everyday life, which is called Opus Dei within the Catholic Church. And their uh, former, former leader called Monsignor Alvaro del Portillo uh, was being celebrated in a conference uh, recently in which uh, they were talking 
about his succession of uh, Saint Jose Maria Escriva at the head of Opus Dei, and we were there. Rome's Holy Cross University has been celebrating the life of Spanish Monsignor Alvaro del Portillo. He took up the reins of Opus Dei from the founder Saint Jose Maria Escriva in 1982. After a miracle attributed to his intercession, del Portillo himself will soon be declared a blessed. His life of holiness was in the footsteps of one declared saint, and as a secretary during the Second Vatican Council, he lived in the presence of other men on that path. I would say that holiness appeared during the Second Vatican Council because it is very beautiful to think about this. John XXIII will be canonized, Pope Paul VI is moving on the path of being a blessed, and besides, these protagonists of the Council were Father Alvaro, who is also going to be beatified now. So this all reminds us of the holiness within the Second Vatican Council and its message of holiness for the future of the Church. Now the incredible thing, Brian, is the number of people present at that conference who actually knew Bishop Alvaro de Portillo. It's just like John Paul II. These people had an incredible influence on so many people. And there are going to be a lot of people present, both for his beatification and for John Paul II's canonization coming up this spring. All right, a great wrap-up from our Alan Holdren joining us from Rome. And Pope Francis and Argentina's president are putting aside their political differences for now, this week. The two met at the Vatican yesterday for their third private meeting since the Holy Father's election. The visit was to commemorate the Pope's first anniversary. The two also exchanged gifts and had lunch together. Then the Pope, or when he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, the two often clashed politically. Also, to mark Pope Francis's one-year anniversary, the Vatican has released a new series of coins and stamps. All of the memorabilia items carry the face of Pope Francis, and demand is expected to be high. That's not the only souvenir that's available, though. You can also pick up a rosary box with Pope Francis' picture on it. Catholics, Anglicans, and Muslims met in the Vatican Press Office for the first time this week to launch an anti-human trafficking project. The Global Freedom Network aims to end modern-day slavery by the end of the decade. The five-year plan will encourage governments, businesses, and other groups to rid the world of human trafficking. Organizers hope that more faith communities will join to stop the exploitation of an estimated 30 million people. Up next on News Nightly, with World Down Syndrome Day approaching, we'll meet a teen who is sure to bring a smile to your face. And did you know the man who's credited with discovering Down Syndrome could be a saint someday? We'll learn about his cause next. Thanks for being with us on EWTN News Nightly. World Down Syndrome Day is coming up on Friday. This is a special day to celebrate the lives of so many people who are living life to the fullest. EWTN News Nightly's Jason Calvi spent some time with a very special teen who's doing just that. Meet 13-year-old Rebecca Cameron. Hi. She has Down Syndrome. It's actually a positive thing and a wonderful thing that God has given us. And parents Laura and Leon say Rebecca is a gift for the whole world. She loves to laugh. She loves to make people laugh. But many children like Rebecca never get to bring their smiles to this world. A 2012 comprehensive study in the prenatal diagnosis journal found 67 to 85 percent of U.S. parents receiving a diagnosis of Down syndrome abort their children. But Rebecca helped one mom choose life. It just melts at her heart. And, um, and I think for the first time she was able to see that, you know, Rebecca is a person with um, love and joy, and, and uh, she's able to give it and receive it. The Camerons can understand the fear parents might have. We were rejoicing in the birth, but we were also very scared. But they quickly learned not to be afraid. The reward is tremendous. Um, Yes, she needs extra help. Baby, to bed, honey. Why, wow, thanks. Aww. Rebecca comes home and plays after a long day of school. <laughs> She's a sign of God's goodness to our family. For grace, you are sweaty. But the only person my friends are teacher. Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Amen. Amen. Good job, buddy. Okay, I'll get Beautiful. Did you know the scientist credited with discovering the cause of Down syndrome is being considered for sainthood? Dr. Jerome Lejeune, a former French geneticist, made this discovery about the role of chromosome 21 in 1958. 
When he dedicated his life to searching for a cure and caring for those with Down syndrome, Pope John Paul II named Lejeune the first president of the Pontifical Academy for Life. We're joined by Ode de Ga, the woman in charge of promoting Lejeune's cause for sainthood, as well as Mark Bradford, president of Lejeune Foundation USA. It's good to have both of you with us. I know you're getting ready to celebrate Down Syndrome Day. Where is the cause of Dr. Lejeune right now, Ode? The cause has been proceeding in Rome for two years now, and uh, we are writing the Posicio. It's a book of uh, 1,000 pages where we have to show um, the virtues, the Christian virtues of Jerome Jeune. So how did he practice these virtues as, as a, um, in a heroic manner, so level. So it's a very huge work and we have to study everything, all, all what he wrote and said and all his life, private life, public life and in his job. And after that, we will show this book to all the cardinals, and they will, they will have to vote and to say yes or not. The virtues were well, heroic. Mark, tell us about this scientist and how he really brought faith and science together. Yeah, well, Jerome Lejeune, of course, was a great man of faith, and uh, um, we believe that science and faith have their origins in the same source, right? We believe that God is the creator of the universe, is the one who set the laws of nature in motion, and it's those laws of nature that scientists study. So really there can be no contradiction between faith and reason, and the church has made that very clear, I think, in a wonderful document several years ago, Fides et Ratio. But Jerome Lejeune really, I think, embodied this synthesis in his person because he was a, a deeply rooted in the natural moral law and a deep man of faith and a, and a scientist and medical researcher and physician at the same time. And how ironic it is that the, that the knowledge that he gave us is being used now to discern whether a child has Down syndrome and is leading to so many abortions. What did he, how did he deal with that? Yeah, well, it was a, a great tragedy to him. You know, his daughter, Clara, wrote a wonderful book about his life called Life is a Blessing. And in that book, she recounts the story of Jerome Lejeune in his clinical practice one day with a young patient coming in and running with his arms, reaching out for Jerome Lejeune and said, you have to save us, you have to save us, they're trying to kill us. And it was at the time in the 1970s when the abortion laws were first loosened in France and they began aborting children with Down syndrome. And this child had seen that on the news the night before and was horrified. And as Jerome Lejeune's daughter Clara says, that was a turning point in his life. At that moment he realized how he had to commit his life to working to find treatments that would give parents encouragement and hope to keeping their children and to not abortion, aborting them. He was horrified by the prospect. Well, as the cause moves forward, we hope that you'll keep us abreast of the news about the uh, cause of Jerome Lejeune. We thank you both for being with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank Great you. being here. Mark thank Bradford you. and Eau Duga, thank, thank you so you. much. Italy's National Down Syndrome Association is putting out a video for the event that's going viral. It focuses on this year's theme, Everyone Has the Right to Be Happy, and showcases faces from all over Europe. Don't be afraid. Tu niño podrá hacer muchas cosas. Podrá marchar. Podrá correr hacia ti. Il pourra parler y te dire qu'il t'aime. Il pourra aller à l'école comme todos. Il ne sera bien. Un volte sera. C'est pas pareil pour toutes les mères. Tu es fille, pour ta reste, c'est fini. Comme la sonaille. Et tu seras heureuse aussi. I'm sure you'd like to chat about that on Twitter. Don't forget the official hashtag, Dear Future Mom. And after a long, rough winter, 
Spring finally arrives on Thursday along with a fresh new edition of EWTN News Nightly. Now you can watch News Nightly Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We're growing toward five nights by Easter week, so welcome spring with us and EWTN News Nightly this Thursday. We hope you'll join us tomorrow and again on Thursday, and be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can catch tonight's news again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching. In honor of St. Patrick's Day this week, we close tonight with a video tribute from our photojournalist Mark Irons to the man who spread the faith to the Emerald Isle. Good night. I typically light a, uh, a candle to St. Patrick uh, once a week. Patrick is an example. He's one of the heroes of the faith that says to you and to me, you can do the same thing. Today, you can have that impact of sharing the good news of God's love. In our lives and our challenges, I think we can look at St. Patrick as one of those individuals who really sought out the, the love of Jesus in his heart. Thank God for St. Patrick.